Amen. How many of you are glad Jesus reigns? That's awesome. Uh, it's great to be here with you. Uh, my name is Max. For those of you don't, those of you that don't know me, uh, I am the small groups pastor here at CCC. Uh, pastor Lawson and Barbara are uh, out of town on a brief uh, mini vacation before September hits. Uh, if you haven't heard, September is going to be an awesome month around here. We got a lot going on. Jesse Duplantis will be here on the seventh. We have our small groups fair on the fourteenth. The 26th, we have Carmen, and then uh, the 28th uh, following Sunday, we have Andrew Womack. So lots of awesome stuff going on. Uh, who's excited? <laughs> well, we're excited, and we also have special healing services uh, starting uh, the second Wednesday of September, and those will run every second Wednesday uh, of September um, until God tells us not to do it anymore, so, or until everybody's healed. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, I'm excited to get a share with you this evening. I have to be a little bit scholarly in the way I, I present this message tonight. Not, not too much, but uh, I thought I'd break out my, my old-fashioned English teacher outfit. And uh, nothing says anointed quite like a sweater vest. And so uh, I'm feeling good. I think, I think it'll be a good message. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, let's go ahead and pray here, and we'll get into uh, what I believe God wants us to hear tonight. Father, and we just come before you humbly in the name of Jesus. We acknowledge our dependence on you. We acknowledge, Lord, that uh, without you, we're nothing. Without you, we, we have no purpose. And, uh, but we thank you, God, that we aren't without you. We thank you that your presence is here with us. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're the teacher. Let my words tonight be like fire. Let them create. Let them create your kingdom. Let them destroy the works of the devil in Jesus' name. And Father, I just thank you for a great release of this truth tonight about how your kingdom comes to this earth. I thank you, Lord, that you want, Lord, that you want heaven to come to earth and you want to use us to do it. Help us to understand what that means and how to partner with you to accomplish that goal. And we thank you for it. We receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you can open your Bibles to Psalm 84. What we're going to do tonight is talk about how the kingdom of God comes to this earth. Jesus instructed us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a great prayer. The question is, what do we do after we pray it? How do we actually partner with God to see that accomplished? I really only have two goals left in life. I, when I was a kid growing up, I had a, a whole bunch of goals. I wanted to be an astronaut, and then I wanted to be a fighter pilot, and I wanted to be a starship captain and a Jedi, and a whole bunch of different things. And then as I got, uh, as I got even older, I wanted to be an uh, English professor, and then I wanted to be a lawyer, and all these kinds of things. Uh, and what I've found is, as I've spent a lot of time here and a lot of time in my relationship with God, that those uh, things that I've, I've dreamed about, and we'll talk more about this in a second, they've really become really narrow. And there's really only two things that I'm concerned about in a big picture anymore. Now, I, I have goals other than, the, than these, but this is the driving force of my life. The number one thing I care about is found in Philippians chapter 3, and it's what Paul said, I long to know him. That's what I want more than anything. I want to know God. I want to know Jesus. I want to know him in an intimate way. I don't want to just know about him. I don't want to just have good theology. Theology is important. I believe in diligence with the Scripture, diligence in what we believe. But ultimately, if we understand Scripture and we can quote all the stuff, but we don't know him, if we don't know what's on his heart, if we can't sense the subtle movements of what he's saying and what he's doing, then ultimately it's, it's not what God's called us to do. I want to know him. And then the second part really flows out of that. And that is that, so this is my internal calling, to know him and to love him with all my heart. The first commandment is... You will love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. That's the number one thing. After that, 
What do I want to do? I have one calling, one external calling here on the earth, and it is simply defined in this phrase, on earth as it is in heaven. Bring the kingdom of God to this earth. That is the external calling that is on every one of our lives. We're all called into intimate fellowship, intimate relationship with God. But as we'll see in this scripture here in just a moment, that will result in, if we do it correctly, a release of God's kingdom here on the earth. And that's what God longs for. And we need to understand how the process actually works. What does it really look like? And this is the stuff that I dream about. And when I say I want heaven to come to earth, uh, you know, I think the things, I, you know, I don't know what comes into your mind, but a lot of people immediately think healing. That's what I think about. There's no sickness in, in heaven, right? So if, the, if, if heaven is to come to earth, I need to, I need to destroy sickness. We need to come against it. We need to pray against it. That's absolutely right. Jesus healed a man and then told him the kingdom of God has come upon you. But the kingdom contains more than healing. The kingdom also contains financial prosperity. It also contains peace. It also contains emotional well-being. It also contains relational well-being. How you relate to your kids. One of the things my wife and I are studying right now, because we have an eight-month-old, is I want to I parent him from heaven. I want to accurately represent Father God to him. And so I need to think about what that actually looks like. All that is contained in the kingdom. The kingdom is much bigger than a guy standing in a pulpit talking about stuff. It touches every facet, every aspect of our lives. Uh, I've defined it this way. When I say I want heaven to come to earth, what I mean simply is this. I want the wisdom, power, and love of God to touch every aspect of every facet, every segment of society. Amen. Amen. There's a lot of teaching about the seven mountains of society. I won't try to list all of them for you. There's different lists. But the, the idea is that it's not just the religious realm. It's not just what goes on here. God's kingdom wants to invade your business. Amen. God's kingdom wants to invade your home. He wants to invade, he deeply wants to invade the arts. The arts create culture. One of the things the church has failed to do, and we're, we're changing this and we're getting much better, but one of the things that the church has failed to do is we have allowed the world to dominate the arts. We've, we've unfortunately told those people that that's ungodly and it's not part of the kingdom. And all the artists went and became new age and all this stuff. And it's driving the culture of our country. And it's a terrible thing. And God wants to invade, not, not in a dominion sense, but through service and love and wisdom, He wants to come into that sector of society and begin to change culture. So, open your Bibles. I think I already told you this. Psalm 84, are you there? <laughs> psalm 84 is a psalm of the kingdom. It actually shows us how this happens, how it gives us a model of how heaven comes to earth. Uh, before I, we read it, though, before we dive in, I want to read to you just this excerpt from this story about something that happened in the life of Smith Wigglesworth. Uh, if you haven't heard of Smith Wigglesworth, he was an amazing man of God, known a lot of times for the, the many miracles that happened in his life. He, he was a, 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 called the Apostle of Faith. He lived in the late 1800s, early 1900s in England and traveled around, did a lot of amazing things. He also had an extremely intimate relationship with God, which shouldn't surprise us if he saw that many healings. Uh, but this describes uh, an, an interesting thing that happened in his life. It's a little bit vague in the way that it's, it's written. I apologize for that. You'll get the gist of it. I'll try to explain it to you as we go through here. It, it says this. There were 11 leading, so it's actually, it's describing uh, two different prayer meetings that Smith was, was leading, okay? So the first one here, there were 11 leading Christians in prayer with our brother uh, Smith at a special afternoon meeting. Each had taken a part. The evangelist then began to pray for the dominion, and as he continued, each, according to their measure of spirituality, 
got out. They left the room. The power of God filled the room, and they could not remain in an atmosphere supercharged by the power of God. The author, on hearing this from me, who was present, registered a vow that if the opportunity came, he at any rate would remain whomever else went out. During the stay in the sounds, a special meeting was called to pray for other towns in New Zealand yet to be visited. A like position to the other meeting now arose. Here was the opportunity, the challenge, and the contest was on. A number prayed. Then the old saint, Wigglesworth, began to lift up his voice, and as strange as it may seem, the exodus began. A divine influence began to fill the place. The room became holy. The power of God began to feel like a heavy weight. With a set chin and a definite decision not to budge, the only other one now left in the room hung on and hung on and hung on until the pressure became too great and he could stay no longer. With the floodgates of his soul pouring out a stream of tears and with uncontrollable sobbing, he had to get out or die. And a man who knew God, as few do, was left alone, immersed in an atmosphere that few men could breathe in. After this, everything changed for Wigglesworth. He had only to walk past people, and they would come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and turn to Jesus for salvation. Increasingly, miracles and healings occurred. The glory of God fell whenever he prayed or preached. I don't know about you, but that really does something to me. Look at Psalm 84, verse 1 and verse 2. How amiable, how beautiful, how lovely, how desirable. All those words are contained there. How amiable are your tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. The tabernacles of God are beautiful. Tabernacles, plural. Why? It's prophetic. Now, it could be talking about commentators have said, well, it's, you know, there was the holy place and the most holy place. And also there was, there was the Davidic tabernacle and then there was the Mosaic tabernacle. So that's absolutely true. However, 1 Corinthians 6 tells us unequivocally that the Holy Spirit lives where? In us. How amiable, how beautiful are your tabernacles. What's happening here? David, or whoever wrote this psalm, is looking at a tabernacle. He's looking at, he's talking about a physical building. And he's thinking, that place is so beautiful, it makes me long for the person inside it. The lives of the saints that have gone before us if we'll study them, they're beautiful. And they will cause us to long for the God that lived on the inside them, of them. Amen? Amen? Does that make sense? I want to live my life in such a way that people look at it and they think, I want what's inside that person. I want my life to be beautiful. Not so I can get glory, but so he can get glory. And so that, the, and what, what this is saying, I, I, I want, the reason I read this story about Smith Wigglesworth is when I read this, it creates an intense hunger on the inside of me. It renews my passion to pursue God. Now, I understand uh, there's a, a, a balance that we need to strike here. And it's on the one hand, I'm full. God lives on the inside of me in my spirit. I have all of God. That's absolutely true. But as I've mentioned to you on several, of occa several occasions, what's in me and what's coming out of me are two different things. What's in my spirit and what's in my soul are two different things. God can live in my spirit 
And yet I never take time to fellowship with him in my soul. There's lots of believers that live huge portions of their life with God Almighty, all powerful, all loving, all consuming on the inside of them and never actually relate to him, never actually experience him, never actually engage in conversation back and forth. And there are saints that have gone before us, great men and women of God, who have done that. And you can see the result of it in their life. And it makes us, it, it, it creates in me this longing. My heart cries out. There's a twofold cry. My heart cries. What does my heart cry for? To know him. But then also my flesh cries. Why does my flesh cry? Because I long not just to have relation to, with, relationship with him, but because I long to see his kingdom released in the earth. I read stuff like this when I was a young boy, when I was 14, 15. I'd read stories about Kenneth Hagin and Smith Wigglesworth and, and people like that. And I would read these stories about them seeing people heal. And it created two things, a twofold longing. One, I wanted to know the God they knew. And number two, I wanted to see the stuff they saw. And I'm seeing it. Not to the level that I want to yet, but I'm in process. I'm on the way. How does the kingdom come to this earth? It starts with hunger. You have to want it. You really do. Hunger, desire for God, will cause me to reorder and reshape things in my life so that I, I'm not trying to move God. I'm not trying to get God to do anything. God's already done everything. But hunger will empower me to change what I believe, to take the steps of faith necessary so that I can see the things come that I want to see come. It's really important. Everybody with me? Everybody okay? Now, I think that first part is pretty clear, but let's read verse 3. This is where it gets a little strange. So he's talking about hunger. He's talking about the house of God, his longing for the presence of God, for relationship with God and to see that God's kingdom come. And then he says this, yes, the sparrow has found a house and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young, even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. So apparently... In God's house, there's an altar, and there are some birds having a nest there, laying some eggs, hatching those eggs, and God says, I'm cool with that. How bizarre. In, uh, in Genesis 30, there's an equally strange story. Uh, Jacob is having problems with his father Laban. Laban has been changing his wages, trying to get him to uh, basically want to take advantage of him. And in Genesis 30, uh, Jacob goes to Laban and says, look, here's what I'm going to do. I'll just take all the speckled and spotted and, and weird looking uh, cows and you keep all the nice looking ones. And Laban thinks, hey, great. Now this is great. This guy's such an idiot. He's given me all the... And, and so, but what Jacob does, and for a long time this just baffled me, he gets these sticks and he cuts stripes in them. All right? And he sticks them uh, down by the, the lake where the cattle and sheep and stuff would come and feed. And when the really strong, really healthy cattle would come down there, he would put out these striped, these spotted... Uh, uh, stakes. The idea being that they would look at them while they were conceiving. Why? Because your environment, what you're looking at, 
affects what you conceive. What you're beholding changes what you're giving birth to. Take that concept back here. What is this saying? God's saying that His altar, His presence, the place of sacrifice where His presence rests, that's the place where things are meant to be conceived and given birth to. He's actually talking about the dreams of His people. He's actually saying that in the presence of God, in the place of sacrifice, that is where dreams are meant to be created and then given birth to. What do I mean by that? As I said to you, when I was growing up, I had all these dreams, and, and none of them were terrible at all. You know, they were, they were, I wanted to, to uh, be an astronaut, and Mom was like, yeah, go for it. We'll send you this camp, and I built this rocket ship, and then I wanted to be a Star Trek, uh, starship captain, so I got this model, and I, you know, I had this, I was a real nerd, and I had, you know, I had this Enterprise model, and I'm like, do, you know, but anyway, uh, so all these things are going on, but what's, what happens as I'm pursuing God, I have relationship with God, as I experience intimacy with Him, it actually begins to shape and change my desires and my dreams. It actually begins to impact what I dream about, what I want. And as I get up on the altar and I say, God, it's no longer about my selfish dreams, I sacrifice those. I let those go, but then the presence of God falls, consumes that sacrifice, and I am reborn with new dreams and new desires that actually come from Him. And if you don't know that, you'll actually try to kill the dreams that God gives you and call it holiness. You'll actually kill the God-given desires that God has placed on the inside of you because you think that God wants to kill all your dreams. And it's terrible. Now, I'm not giving you license to be, to be selfish and all that. It's, it's on the altar. My dreams are on the altar. But they're also born out of intimacy and fellowship with God. Um, how does the kingdom come? The kingdom is a family. How many of you know that? Are you guys okay? Is this okay? The kingdom's a family. What does a father want? Now, here's the thing. Not a, not a carnal father, but what does a heavenly-minded father want for his children? wants absolutely the best. When it comes to this realm of dreams, here's, here's what religion has taught us. That Father God wants your obedience. That's what He wants. And that's a lie. He wants much more than that. Now some people would say, okay, that's right. He doesn't want your obedience. He wants your heart. Because if he'll get your heart, he'll get your obedience. That's true, but it still makes obedience the end goal. Here's what your heavenly Father wants. On the cross, once and for all, Jesus got down on one knee and said, here's my heart. I'm offering it to you. I'm opening myself up. I'm making myself vulnerable. I can be hurt. I'm demonstrating to you, I love you. I can't take this back. He can't take it back. He made the commitment. He sold out. He popped the question. <laughs> what does he want? He wants you to say, here's my heart. And if I make myself vulnerable to him and he makes himself vulnerable to me, if my Heavenly Father can have my heart, then we can dream together. 
And that's what he wants. Servants build their master's kingdom through obedience. Sons build their father's kingdom through participating in his dreams. Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's a good word. That, that ought to make you excited. Song of Solomon 7. Look at Song of Solomon 7. What am I talking about? I'm saying this. We want the kingdom of God to come to this earth, right? Yeah. How many of you want that? Yeah. Yeah. How does it happen? I have desire for God. That brings me into intimate relationship with Him. As I have desire with, for God and I have that intimate relationship, it alters what I dream about. And when I give birth to that dream, that's the kingdom. The kingdom of God is released into the earth through the dreams of His people. I dreamed about seeing people healed years before I ever saw anybody healed. I dreamed about it. I'd think about it at night. I'd read the Bible. I'd read the scriptures about it. I'd, I'd watch testimonies. I'd listen to Andrew. I, I'd, one of the things I would do before I ever called out a word of knowledge and saw somebody healed, I'd get uh, Andrew Womack's uh, The Gospel Truth Seminars, and I'd fast forward all the way to the end just to where he was calling out words of knowledge, and I'd watch him do it. And I'd dream about doing it. And I'd think about it. And when I give birth to that dream, people get healed and the kingdom comes. That's a simple thing. But it's powerful. Song of Solomon 7, this is a, these verses just really wreck me. Uh, verse 10 through 12 if I had more time, I'd talk you through the entire book, but the, the book is about the bride of Christ reaching maturity. At the beginning, she's immature, and so Jesus is saying to her, he's inviting her, and he's saying, come up here into your destiny. Anybody ever felt like Jesus said that to you? He's inviting you into a new level. He's saying, come up here. And at one point, she says, I'm going to stay down here. That looks scary up there. And he doesn't respond in anger. He doesn't say, well, I'm, forget you. He responds in love and kindness, and he draws her to a place of maturity. Um, so he loves her to a place of wholeness. And uh, it's interesting, in verse 10, it says, I am my beloved's, and his desire is towards me. This is actually a refrain that appears three times throughout the book. At the beginning, she starts out and she says, my beloved is mine, and I'm his. The promises are mine, healing's mine, prosperity's mine, all these things are mine, and I'm his. A little bit further in the book, she says, I'm my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. I won't talk you through that, but think about it. Then at the end here, she actually doesn't say anything else. She actually leaves off the part about him being hers. She says, I'm my beloved's. This is her defining characteristic. He's won my heart. He owns me completely, not in a dominating kind of way, but he's loved me so relentlessly I have nowhere else to go. It's removed all other options. I am my beloved's and his desire is towards me. She leaves out the part about her needs. Essentially, this is what's happened. He's loved her so radically to a point where she can't even think about what she needs anymore. How many of you think that would be amazing? I'm not quite there yet, but I'm, I'm more there than I have been in the past. God loves me so much that I think about myself much less than I used to. Amen? Then she says this. I love this. She says to Jesus, Come, my beloved, let us go forth into the field. Let us Lodge in the villages. Let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine flourish, whether the tender grape appear and the pomegranates bud forth, and there I will give you my loves. Everybody say, let us. Let us. Let us. Let us. 
Maturity looks like this. Jesus, let us go and pray for the sick. It's partnership. Let us go and get people saved. Let us go and build churches. Let us go and release your dominion over every sector, every sphere of society. It's no longer Jesus imploring her to come, nor is it her waiting for orders. It's partnership. It's the dreams flowing together. That's what God longs for. He's looking for a people that will be appropriate, helpers meet, helpers appropriate, helpers equal to His Son. It's my opinion, and I'm right, (laughs) that the church, the local church, is the best means of releasing God's kingdom into the earth. That's what I believe. I love parachurch ministry. I absolutely love it. This is not a criticism of that at all. I just believe that I, I think that God wants all that stuff to be done in the context of church. That's how I see it. And you say, well, you're a pastor. Yeah, I am. So God's called me to go start a church. I don't know when that's going to happen. I don't have a timeline all those kinds of things. Why am I doing it? I'm not doing it because I think, well, it'd be great to start a church and I can do this every Sunday. No, I'm doing it because I want to see heaven come to earth. That's why you plant a church. Now, here's the amazing thing about it. God's told me that he will not order me to do it. There are times I wish he would. Because it'd be clear. But for him to accomplish through me what he wants to accomplish, I have to dream it. It has to be, it has to be birthed on the altar out of intimacy with him. It has to be a cry of my heart, let us go and plant a church. Now, I'm not saying God will never order anybody to do anything. I'm saying this is where I'm at in my relationship with God, and that's what's going on. Everybody understand that? God's told me to do things before, and when I, He does, I, you know, I obey. I believe in obedience. Giving birth is a messy process. I know firsthand. I was in there. It was intense. It's not for the faint of heart. It's messy. God says it's okay for that mess to happen on my altar. It's okay if God gives you a dream, you set about to put it into action, and it comes out ugly and screaming. <laughs> with a misshapen head. I had to suck my son out. He looked like a cone head. I mean, it was, it was like... Do you know I wasn't disturbed by that? It didn't bother me at all. I loved the little guy. Don't be disturbed if your dream initially starts small and it comes out and it's like, is that really it? (laughs) First time I taught, (laughs) that's kind of how it was. (laughs) Was that it, God? That's what you did, son. Good try. That's how he views it. Good job. You tried it. Do it again. Go after it again. Go back to Psalm 84. Actually, um, actually, stay here real quick. I want to draw your attention. So this will tie into back to Psalm 84. So she says, let us do all these things. Let us go into the vineyard. Vineyard is uh, it's a type of people's heart. So she's talking about ministry that produces fruit and these kinds of things. 
Um, but she says, there will I give you my loves. What she's saying is, while we're doing this ministry that's the dream of both our hearts, what am I going to do? I'm going to recommit myself to my pursuit of you and my affection and my love for you. Why? Because it's dangerous once the dream starts being birthed to get your eyes on the dream rather than on the author. Go back to Psalm 84. How does the kingdom come? How amiable are your tabernacles, O Lord of hosts? Your dwelling places are so beautiful. There's people's lives that I, I'm impressed with, and I, I, that I have heroes, not in a weird worship kind of way, but they're people that I admire, and I want to be like them, and it creates a desire to know their God, to know my God, to know Him intimately. That affects what I dream about. It affects what I want. And I give birth to those things on the altar. And then it says, uh, blessed are they that dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Think about that. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the ways of them. That's an awkward uh, verse, the last part there. Different translations say it this way. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on a journey or set on a pilgrimage. Another translation says, blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Anybody have that translation? I like that one. It says, so the word there in the Hebrew is actually highways. What's he talking about? He's saying this, you initially started this thing by committing on a journey to know God. As that starts to bear fruit, recommit to the journey. Everybody understands that, yeah, I, I need to know God, but it's easy when, when things start happening and you get busy. And I, I know I'm here. I could spend all day if I wanted to just sitting down with people and trying to, trying to help them walk through the pain and the hurt and the various things in their lives. And I love to do that. That brings the kingdom. But that's not my primary purpose for being on the earth. What's my primary purpose? Go back to it. I'm on a journey to Zion. What's Zion? It's the place where God's manifest presence dwells. I'm on a journey to know Him. And I'm committed to that regardless of what else is going on. And then it says this amazing statement, and I think this is the most beautiful picture of, of uh, the kingdom coming. It says... Who, passing through the valley of Baca, which is the valley of weeping or the valley of sorrow, they make it a well, the rain also filling the pools. So what is he saying? Here's what my life looks like, and this is really what I try to do. And I'm not, I'm not perfect, but this is what I try to do. I'm on a journey to know God, and that's how I see my life. And so I'm on this journey. And I've got my eyes fixed on that end goal to know Him, to experience Him. But as I'm doing that, I'm, I'm walking through this valley of weeping. There's weeping all around me. There's messed up stuff. There's sick people. There's uh, impoverished people. There's all these problems, all this need around me. What do I do? I keep my eyes focused on this. I'm focused on the journey. I go forward, but the overflow of my life comes out and begins to fill those pools. It begins to transform those places of barrenness, those places of brokenness into springs of life. Amen. One of the things that we sometimes miss in the church that we and I'm not being critical, I'm just trying to be honest about what we need to do so that we can tweak things, is that, it's, and I, and I understand, it's easy. It's easy to get our eyes on all the need. There's all this need. There's this weeping all around me. And we sometimes create entire ministries, entire ways of thought around meeting that need. Do 
Jesus said, you'll always have the poor with you. Why? Because it's the nature of people's hearts that there's always going to be problems. We help a lot of people, but the need always outweighs the finances we have to help. Just being honest. So if I'm driven by that, then all the people I can't help, I'm focused on that, and I see that all the time as failure. And it depresses me. But if I have my heart set on a journey that I'm going here, and while I'm going there, I'm bringing there here, then those needs get taken care of as a byproduct of the journey that I'm on. Amen. That's an important truth. That'll help you. There's, there's many of you that you have real needs in your family. You have real things that are real problems that need to be dealt with. I understand that. What I'm saying is, Matthew 6.33 says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. All this other stuff's going to be added. Seek him first, his kingdom will come. And it'll be better than if your eyes are continual on, on all this need and all this hurt around you. Everybody say amen. amen. Last thing about this, it says that in my heart, in our hearts, there are highways to Zion. There's only one way to, Je uh, to God. It's through Jesus. Everybody understands that. However, there are different ways of, of, of uh, approaching God, of accessing God. And by that I mean, you know, I can, go, I can talk to God through the Scripture, I can pray, I can worship. There's different avenues through which I, I come into fellowship with God. Everybody familiar with that? That's true. This is saying that those are like, over time, they become like well-worn highways. You become familiar with them. And highways are two-way streets. So as I'm going towards God and I'm getting familiar with this pathway, it carves out a path for His world to come backwards that way and fix all the stuff behind me that I'm going after, that I'm, while I'm going after Him. I don't know if I said that well, but anyway. All right, Matthew 13, I'll end here. Everybody okay? You guys are... You guys are doing a good job. I appreciate you bearing with me here. Matthew 13, 31. Another parable of the kingdom he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of a mustard seed, which a man took and he sowed in his field which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it's grown, it is the greatest among herbs. It becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come to lodge in the branches thereof. What is this saying? We want the kingdom to come. It always starts small. It always starts in the heart of a person. Abraham had a dream to have a son. One. He was upset because his inheritance was going to go to this other guy that wasn't part of his family. God, can I have a son? Sure. And the kingdom came. And Abraham had millions of sons, including the Messiah. <laughs> Pastor Lawson when he was in Kit Carson, had a dream. It was to come here and plant a church. It started small. A couple families. Didn't look, came out, didn't look, is, like, is that it? <laughs> he kept at it. He believed in the dream. And it's grown into this thing that you see before us and is keeping growing. It's going to continue to grow. And it's becoming a tree, a strong, mighty oak tree or a mighty, I, I was wondering, about, is that a, a mustard tree? Is, I guess, is that what that is? I mean, a mustard seed produces a, 
a mustard tree? I don't know, but. <laughs> the Frenches grow on it. I mean, I don't, but. <laughs> the kingdom starts small. But if you don't despise the small beginnings, you believe in the dream, you keep at it, it grows into something, and it says these fowls, these birds, come and nest in the branches. There's lots of debate about what that means. I'm just going to offer you a suggestion. The birds are something external to the tree. Right? Deep theology. They aren't part of the tree. The tree's the kingdom. Right? The kingdom, when it is mature, actually provides blessing and shelter to people that aren't part of the kingdom. And then it draws them actually into the kingdom. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Yes. Amen. Let's all stand up. Here's what we want to do. I want to pray into this. I think there's many of you that have maybe not considered dreaming a huge part of the Christian life. And I want to ask you to reconsider that. In Joel, there's a prophecy that in the last days the Spirit will be poured out and it says old men will begin to dream dreams. Why does it say that about old men? Because typically dreams are the province of young men. And as we get older, life crushes the dreams out of us. And that's wrong. It's a lie from the devil. And so what we want to do is we're just going to pray and the Holy Spirit's going to touch hearts. And in those that need it, he's going to restore capacity to dream. And of those of you that have dreams, he's going to rekindle the fire to see those things birthed. So just lay hands on somebody next to you. And we're all just going to pray together. I'll pray for you. Father, Father, we just release right now a fresh anointing to dream. Holy Spirit, I release your presence right now on your children, young and old, Father. And we thank you for renewed dreams the fire and the passion to pursue them, Lord. But ultimately, the passion to pursue you. And I thank you that as we do that, Lord, we're actually giving birth to these things and that that's creating structures and culture, Lord, that bring your kingdom, that bring healing, that bring deliverance, that bring prosperity. Father, we just thank you for that. We release it over this wonderful congregation. We give them liberty, Lord. We restore to them the freedom to dream. We thank you for it. We thank you for it and we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want to thank you guys so much for coming. You're a blessing. You're dismissed. Feel free to uh, hang out and chat for a little bit, but uh, be back Sunday. We have services 825 and 10 p.m. It's going to be awesome. What? What did I say? I said p.m.? So